Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisendahl. Joe, it is coming up to the one-year anniversary of last year's banking drama. I'm still not sure if we can call it a crisis or not. Uh, it kind I, of know, felt crisis-y at did, the time. But it went away so fast. You know what the funny thing was, and I, I probably mentioned it, is there was that cliche or, I don't know, thing that people say, oh, the Fed is going to keep hiking rates until something breaks. Oh, yeah. It's like, oh, here's the break. It happened. And then it was like a blip. It's like nothing. And then the Fed kept hiking and stocks kept going up and everyone forgot about it. So it's kind of weird that something that dramatic could happen and seemingly then just sort of get forgotten about kind of quickly. Well, one of the most dramatic things that happened um, out of all of that, I thought, was when they basically just guaranteed everyone's deposits. Right. Yes. So we know at this point that you are supposed to have up to $250,000 of your deposits at any bank or any bank that's FDIC guaranteed. Basically, those are safe. If the bank goes under, you get that money back. But then we saw that Silicon Valley Bank went under and people had more than $250,000 in their accounts and they got bailed out which is kind of phenomenal. I th I don't think we talk about the deposit guarantee yes. aspect of that whole thing enough. We talked about it at the time. And That's I think true. this was the this was the interesting thing and you're right. This is the sort of the bigger thing that has been slipped under the rug, which is if all deposits in all US banks are implicitly federally backed, then do we need to rethink the business of banking? If this huge source of finance, if it's all guaranteed in the end, then it's like, why do we allow these banks to operate as they are? That was a big question. We talked about it in March and April and May, and that's still unresolved, but people have really moved on from that question. But it really is fundamental. Not us. We are still living in spring of 2023. So I'm very pleased to say we do, in fact, have the perfect guest to discuss this. You might remember we spoke with Stephen Kelly a couple weeks ago about how the way we're bailing out banks or supporting them with various liquidity facilities is changing. In this episode, we are going to be focusing on getting to a point where you don't actually <laughs> have to bail out the banks. Let's just avoid this problem altogether. And I'm very pleased to say with us now, we have Anat Edmadi. She is, of course, an economist and professor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. She has written prolifically on this topic for at least as long as I can remember at this point, certainly since the 2008 financial crisis. Anat, thank you so much for coming on All Thoughts. Thank you so much for having me. You know, we needled Stephen a little bit when he was on the show by just yeah. throwing out liquidity things. or solvency. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do the equivalent for you and yep. say, um, how do banks hold capital? Oh, my God. That word <laughs> is a trigger because because that word leads to so much confusion. So I'm glad you started with that. A senator would say it's money on the sideline. Newspaper articles explain it as cash like asset. And it's not true. What we're talking about, this hold capital, is not something that actually the banks hold. It's something that investors hold. In fact, what they do hold is those reserves in the central bank on which they get 5.4%. That's what they hold. That's what's out of the economy set aside. What we're talking about is just like deposits on the funding side. We're talking about equity funding for banks. An amazing idea in banking that you would actually need any of it. And guess what? They live like no corporation lives and no corporation needs to live. But they're there because, you know, I have a lot of research on leverage and leverage addiction. And it's just they are at the point of such heavy indebtedness that, that they hate coming out. So when people think banks need to have more capital or hold more capital, in their mind, what they hear is, oh, banks just need to have more cash set aside right. for an emergency. That's what they say. But in the actual people who understand banking, the idea of having more capital means that more of their funding needs to come from equity. Exactly. So it's all about whether you get your money by promising to pay back or not. And your equity mm. investors, I mean, I come from Silicon Valley, so, you know, who needs to borrow to have a thriving business? Lots of companies don't pay dividends, just grow and grow and grow in market value. And 
you know, you don't need to borrow as much. And in banking, if you just say, hey, why don't you do something good with your earnings, such as, you know, make loans, instead they want to take the money out and they will threaten not to make a loan in the ridiculous campaign they're making right now about this Basel endgame, where in fact what they're displaying, and I like to talk about it that way, is every single symptom of extraordinary overhang or even insolvency at all times. In other words, these are the classic zombie symptoms that in another sector would lead you to fraudulent conveyance in bankruptcy or something, you know, that you're taking the money out, that you're always well, taking risk. Maybe that's a good point to back up a little bit and talk about how you understand the banking business, because a lot of people will hear a statement like, oh, banks should hold more equity. They should have less leverage. And they would think, well, that's what a bank is. You borrow and then you lend. It's a leverage business. Right. It's a leverage business. So like, what exactly are we talking about if it doesn't look like Mm. that? Okay. So so banks are a leverage business in the sense, if we start from the basics, that deposits put them in a leverage position right away. So by the time you take deposits, if we're talking about deposit-taking banks, Mm -hmm. uh, they already start with debt. Unlike a company like in a corporate finance course where we stuck with the all equity firm as a kind of a starting point where you're kind of investing your own money or your own shareholders' money. So now you are already in an area in which the people managing the bank to the extent they're not depositors, are immediately conflicted with depositors over how much equity they would have, how much risk they would take, because of the fact that depositors ultimately, if the bank defaults or if the bank goes into resolution or whatever, you know, they might get paid or not, but the bank walked away with the upside in any case. So from that point on, the banks hate equity. The banker hates equity. So any leveraged equity holder has a resistance to leverage reduction. That's a pervasive phenomenon. And in fact, if you let them adjust leverage just once, it's not like we go to an optimal capital structure, always up, always Mm -hmm. up. So that's the addictiveness of borrowing. Now, what's the business of bank? There is a, a basic conservation in the world. It's not an irrelevancy. It's not that it's irrelevant. It's just relevant in different ways to society and to the banker. The banker hates equity. From their perspective, any bit of it, you know, is 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 too much. From society's perspective, having a huge more equity funding is only good and not bad. And in 15 years of asking the question, why are we even here? Why do they have single digit, you know, depending on all the risk rates, we can get into that. Why Why are we here? You know, they didn't, in the history of banking and certainly relative to other corporations that are not regulated for leverage, even though we subsidize that in the tax code, you don't see corporations like that. How do they ever get away with that? Oh, how they get away with it is the safety nets, all these bailouts all the time, implicit and explicit. And that's really it because the conservation physics of finance that I'm talking about, or physics of money, is there is risk to be borne and taxes to be paid. And if you bear less of it, somebody else bears more of it. If you pay less of it, somebody else pays more of it. So the whole thing we're talking about is whether banks are subsidized to be leveraged, not just want to be leveraged, but encouraged to be leveraged by the system of taxes and and subsidies. And and therefore, they're telling us that they should be getting all these subsidies blanket to their funding, and then they'll do something good with it. So sometimes bailouts are explicit, like such as uh, what we saw in 2008, 2009 with TARP and various programs. Sometimes I guess they're sort of implicit or the idea that, well, we just sort of expect that something like that will come. What else, other than what we call bailouts, you say through taxes, et cetera, what else encourages the demand for further leverage or the prioritization of debt financing versus equity financing? It's the compensation of the bankers. It's any this fixation with return on equity, which is only return on equity on the upside, because on the downside, when you have less leverage, you're protected, you're less negative. So if your actual realized returns are below your funding costs. Hey, where does the fixation of return on equity come from? That. You know, I think that it's a proxy for subsidies. I think it basically means that if you compensate somebody based on return on equity metrics, where, you know, it's always on the upside where it juices up returns, Mm -hmm. then by doing that, by going after the return on equity, they are basically doing what, you know, maybe shareholders want to some extent, but certainly works well for the bankers, um, which is to maximize the subsidy, to maximize the leverage, because through the leverage, you get more subsidies. That's a part of that. This, the bailouts, by the way, is a really complicated system, and you even touched on the 
flubs on the federal home loan banks. It's basically mm-hmm. an interlocking set of institutions that are either providing guarantees or investing lending. So it's either the central banks that would make these excessive loans that we should get into the bank lending programs and, and at the same time, you know, giving for a while higher interest on reserves, which is crazy, as well as the FDIC, which has started guaranteeing all deposits with extraordinarily dangerous situation and sometimes guaranteeing other debt. After the financial crisis, they let even newly created bank holding companies that were investment banks the previous day, like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, right. guarantees on all debt. Now, of course, they could go and raise money from investors guaranteed by the FDIC, which they can do cheaply, no strings attached, and return the top money that Treasury gave them with tiny bit of strings attached. Mm. So it's basically a system between the Fed, the FDIC, and Treasury and FHLBs where there are sort of investments made in the... So basically, the prevention of default. That's a bailout. A third party comes in, you made a promise, and somebody comes in and swoops in and prevents your default. I want to talk a little bit more specifically about the events of last year, because I think they're a good prism to view some of the things you're talking about through. But one of the interesting things is Silicon Valley Bank got in trouble. I don't want to say for doing the right thing, but they did go out into the market and say we're raising equity. And as you put it, you know, there's a reason why banks typically don't like to do that. So this is a great question, and it's a great way, in fact, to see what I'm saying. So what happens is they have definitions these days in the regulatory community of what a well-capitalized bank is. It just so happened that both in the financial crisis and last spring and now, banks are considered well-capitalized by and a lot of the banks that failed, including First Republic, got great camel ratings just before they failed. So they can say it's well-capitalized. Now, why is that? Because the metrics are so bad. And the metrics include not recognizing fair market value on whole to maturity assets. So the bank is pretending to have these assets that it bought at par value, even though they're losing value, like treasuries. In addition, capital ratios depend on risk weights, and the risk weights ignore interest rate risk entirely, only credit risk. So a treasury needs no equity backing. So even if you buy you buy a treasury and you can do it in 100% with deposit money, well, the treasury can lose in value. What happened in Silicon Valley Bank was the following. In banking in general, you know, being a zombie, being insolvent is Monday morning, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what they're showing as symptoms to a corporate doctor right. like myself <clears throat> is every day the symptoms of... Of the more they hate equity, with the passion they hate equity, the more I think they have way too little of it. So that's that. Now, what happened in Silicon Valley Bank, two things. First of all, they had to sell some assets. So this whole to maturity might not actually work out for you. And the assets are worth less as you have to pay more on deposits. The assets are worth less because they're long term, have big duration risk, and interest rates went down. So when they sold, they had to realize the losses. So all of a sudden, accounting rules that usually can allow you to hide the losses are forcing you to recognize the losses. So that was the first thing. Then basically, how would they survive? They were beginning to be more obviously, more visibly insolvent. So the next thing that happens is they try to raise equity, as you said, and they couldn't. Now, if you can raise equity, if somebody, not at a price you like, but at a price, a penny, a dime for your equity, then you might still be insolvent because there's only the upside. It's just an option on the upside because you can always walk away as equity. But if you cannot raise equity, then you're really deep mm-hmm. in the water. So the, the not raising equity is like the ultimate nail in the coffin. In other words, you're definitely uh, insolvent. At that point, the run was unavoidable because, you know, of course, maybe by now that they've guaranteed effectively everything, maybe people won't run. And maybe we consider that kicking the can down the road as a good financial stability measures. But that is extraordinarily dangerous because in the 80s, we allowed all these zombie savings and loans to persist and raise money guaranteed by the taxpayers until, you know, we had to pay for it. One of the arguments, obviously, against higher capital ratios or more equity is like, oh, this will be- lead to an austerity of credit, that banks won't be able to do lending. And this is a big part of the push against some of yeah. these rules yeah. that there's going to be less lending, yeah. et cetera. Why is that wrong in your view? Well, first of all, they can make any loan. My first measure and my first emergency measure since the financial crisis, and you know, I said this with 
20 academics and lots of people is to retain the damn earnings and use them for loans. So what's the problem now? So I've been asking for 15 years, tell me again what would go wrong if they retain their earnings? Just go take me through an argument, an economic argument of how the economy would suffer. In other words, is their subsidy so big that God forbid, you know, they'll die, you know, if they'll die, you know, or they can't survive. I question their business model. If the business, if the entire charter value that you like to talk about is subsidies, then we have to question the business model, just like you started uh, by saying. So my point is the following. If you tell them, not a ratio, actually, I am against giving them ratios from where we are right now. You take them by the hand through issuance and retentions, because then they won't shrink inefficiently. Because a paper I wrote called Leverage Ratchet actually shows the ways of deleveraging. And we show that there is a tendency to lever to asset sales or stopping to lend or whatever, to through shrinkage versus expansion. Well, I will expand. These are monstrous banks, which I'm saying to expand only because I believe that once they live in markets, once they're in equity markets, they will break up on their own inefficient weight. Because Hmm. as conglomerates broke up in the 80s, because it, we don't need such complicated institutions. I was, you know, back in Davos mm-hmm. in 2014 with, with Paul Singer of everybody, and he says these are too opaque. I cannot put my analysts on it and understand their risk. They would not exist in market as they are right now. Once you push them more and more into equity markets, it's equity markets that are giving them the stress test. That's my stress test. Mm. My stress test is raise equity. Let's see at what price. What will investors say when they have to bear the downside is where is the upside? If you don't like that price, maybe that's telling us something. Hmm. Uh, Since you mentioned 2014, I think that was the year when there was a New York Times profile about you. And I cannot remember the exact headline, but it was something like, (laughs) what was it? It was like the woman. This had a whole story behind it, which I won't tell you all of it. But it was by Benjamin Applebaum, who used to be a Fed reporter who I first met when he was a Fed reporter. Uh, And I won't go through all the details. But uh, when he ended up uh, writing the profile, it was entitled, When She Talks, Banks Shudder. Yeah. (laughs) And what I say to... so I've asked a few times about that uh, that uh, with people who noticed the the headline, and uh, I say, "Oh, Jamie Diamond sleeps like a baby." In other words, <laughs> the 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 headline is. Uh, cute but false. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) But this leads into something I wanted to ask you, and I'm trying to think how to phrase this question Uh without sounding hokey. But, you know, you've been criticizing the banks and And their business models and And the the regulators. regulators Especially. The banks do what they get away with. Yeah, for decades now, basically. And Uh, I guess... A decade and a half, yeah. What motivates you Hmm. to do this? Oh, good. Such a good question because I often wonder that myself. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Okay. So what motivated me in the beginning was, you know, I sort of fell in a rabbit hole when I started looking into banking. I'm not just a corporate finance, corporate governance person. And I look at those corporations, which I was teaching my students for, you know, 25 years, what a wonderful market we have. And all of a sudden that market, like what just happened? And then I look at them and I say, okay, I understand about corporations. We don't talk specifically about banks because that's some some other silo in economics. Mm. But if I look at them as a corporate finance person and I say, what's the same and what's different about them? And all of a sudden what's different about them is all bad and what's different about them is what they get away with mm. more than anything you know is the specialness of banks is literally what they get away with and then the politics of banking that's what's special and then I all of a sudden realized you know if nobody understands what the word means if the regulators are standing by if the pol- if the politicians want banks to make some loans or some to campaign donations or whatever else and nobody's exposing the nonsense that we have in this space that pervades this space, that maintains and enables this to continue. So I was basically alarmed by people inside the Fed that terrible things are happening in Basel when they were negotiating that agreement. And I was encouraged by people both inside some places in the Fed and in the Bank of England at the time where I had most of my friends at the time when Mervyn King was there to get involved. And I truly didn't know what I was getting into when I agreed to do this. I was joking that I'm working for Andy Heldine, you know, that kind of thing. So he was at the Bank of England at the time. And so was Mervyn King, uh, who gave us a blurb for the book while in the, while the governor of the bank. So there were big, fierce battles at the time, uh, post-financial crisis about the topic. And I felt and I mobilized a lot of academics to help me, but it was very difficult work. You were at Financial Times at the time, mm-hmm. Tracy, and getting through even 
the opinion pages against bankers is impossible. And that's the opinion pages. Now in the politics, like, forget it. So mm. I began to really see the politics, something I was not aware is so important in finance and how much it plays in banking. So I stayed in this debate, just basically hating to be worn out more than anything, uh, mm. just not wanting for them with the resources that they have, with the amount of lobbying and the amount of money uh, that they spend uh, across the political system and the regulation system and global institutions and all of that to kind of give up because I felt a sense of duty basically to, mm -hmm. to society that I actually know something that's useful and it's my job to say it. But anyway, I worked on it for five, six years and then I essentially wrote a few essays that were kind of putting it to bed around 2015, 16. And that I'm back here is kind of almost didn't happen. It was a decade since the book was published. This book. The book, by the way, I should have said in the intro, it's The Banker's New Clothes and you have a new edition coming out. Exactly. So the book edition just came out in January in the US and the book got fat uh, <laughs> It's because, because, of, because we had to revamp a lot of stuff and take a lot of stuff out of the editing floor to explain more about central banks. So there are a few expansions of the material. The book is called The Banker's New Clothes. What's wrong with banking? What to do about it? The Banker's New Clothes close refers to flood claims. So that's the list of which we now have 44. But somebody just pointed me out to an ad that was apparently in the football games saying yeah. that grocery prices will go up <laughs> and their mother won't be so, able to buy a lollipop if well, you increase capital requirements. So I take it just an increase in capital requirements is probably in your view necessary but not sufficient to a stable financial it's the system. most no-brainer thing but it's, what is an actual you know we sort of tease tracy said in the beginning mm -hmm. well could we ever have a world where we don't have to have bailouts and i'm kind of skeptical that that'll what, have, what would the, what would it take or what is the uh, what is the basics okay. of your prescription so so the basics of our prescriptions, and we go through them extensively in the book, what to aim for, what to watch for as you do this, you know, is basically to maintain, to aim at equity ratios that fluctuate between 20 and 30 percent of total assets. It's important because the risk weights are really mm. the ones that reduce the assets by like a half or more and are gamed continuously uh. and actually add to fragility because you give zero weight to government bonds, you give zero weight to tr risk weighted. They're actually anti-lending, the risk weights themselves. So that's a whole other can of worms. But we're against the risk weights except maybe as a backup. Right now, it's the leverage ratio that is at 3% or maybe 5%. Ridiculous numbers. They are missing a digit. Is We're not there. We're not close to where we need to be. And if people say the industry will shrink, I say, fine, let's, uh, that's maybe a feature, not a bug. In other words, maybe the industry is too bloated and too well, big. I mean, we talk about it on this show all the time. What if it's not a matter of the industry shrinking, but migrating to what people okay. call shadow so, banks or something like okay. that? Okay. Mm -hmm. That's all in the 44 flood claims. <laughs> all of it is there. You'll find the grab bag of them that they use. So what, what sort of nudges people a little bit is the fact that all along, two things are true about the shadow banking system. Number one, institutions in the shadow banking that are not connected as much to the, or not as obviously, to the safety net, to yeah. those bailout system, actually fund with more equity. That was true for REITs, mm. and that was true for like 30% is common sometimes. And then now, one colleague and a few other people have a paper about mortgage lenders, which have to disclose some things in some states. And they analyze it, and they show that lenders for mortgages that are not in the bank Banking sector and are not regulated like banks have twice as much equity as the banks. So hmm. what's the problem in lending with money that's raised, however, in markets? So there's and then the second point about shadow banking is most of the time, I mean, the ultimate, the first incarnation of a shadow bank is money market fund, right? So what ends up happening with shadow banking is most of it, if you follow the money, is connected, funded by, etc the banks in the end. So when you follow the money, you'll find the, the safety net someplace along the way. So money market funds are just creating another layer of intermediation, and then they can run on the banks, their investors can run on them, and then we couldn't, you know, we opened up the, the, the spigot on them in COVID again because their reforms didn't work. You mentioned the initial round of Basel rules sort of post-2008. Yep. And of course, you've already uh, touched on this as mm -hmm. well, but we do have another effort, the Basel Endgame proposal now. When we talked to Steve Kelly about this, he was like, well, why even bother talking about it? Because like, for sure, it's going to change from yeah, yeah, its yeah. current uh, yeah, proposed yeah. form. But maybe with that caveat, can you talk a little bit about 
whether you think that's a useful revision <laughs> of the rules? Well, I signed two comment letters on Basel Endgame and one on the long-term debt proposal, which also kind of triggered me a lot. And I signed one letter by 30 academics who are kind of, you know, friends of the Fed supporting it, saying it's a step in the right direction. And then in my own letter on it, uh, to which I attach the previous version of these 44 flawed claims and, and other writings and testimonies from the last 15 years, I said, well, you know, I hope it's not end game because we will come back to it <laughs> after another financial crisis, if not a bigger, you know, it has to be very spectacular because obviously the last one didn't, uh, you know, affect it enough. In other words, it's really depressing how they always have these liquidity narratives and other things and focus on bailouts again instead of actually going. And, you know, Dodd-Frank said no more bailouts and the, the, there's plenty of authority to do anything, certainly to do even a lot more here on both supervision, which completely failed in this case, and on the target numbers and on making them more meaningful because there's still not meaningful. So why are we talking about it? I would say, yes, these are kind of useless. Are they good? It depends how you enforce them. All of these rules end up not, you know, if you look just at the radar that shows you these ratios, you won't even know there was a financial crisis. The banks that needed the most bailout looked good all through the crisis, you know, and that's an, a study that was also done after the crisis. So the Bottom line is, we don't like the metrics, we don't like the numbers, the range of numbers. And so I'm coming at it from completely the other side. I'm saying this continues to be poorly designed and inadequate. And in addition to this, I am not a hawk on other regulation. It's just this one is just correcting a huge distortion. It's only on the funding side. It's liquidity regulations that put money on the sidelines. Mm. It's the liquidity regulations that are costly in good times and useless in a run. You know, so that's the problem. So a lot of living wheels, complicated risk weights, stress tests. I gave you my stress test, market stress test. So I'm totally into just bringing the funding into markets and especially into equity markets. Start with that and the rest might look a little bit better. So one of the things that comes up when talking about the endgame proposal is the idea of, you know, well, poor Michael Barr needs to build oh, consensus. Yeah. He has to talk to all these different stakeholders yep. about like very technical yep. and complicated yep. things. Can you give us a little bit of color on your experience about yeah. how new banking rules actually come into being? I'm always curious. Oh, the, you know, the sausage making is amazing. So I was actually in D.C. and I met a few of the regulars, including Mike Barr. I think it's on his official calendar, so I can tell you that. And yes, and everybody was feeling very sorry for Michael Barr. I, of course, was feeling frustrated that he, you know, didn't speak more strongly. His first speech was okay, but afterwards, you, oh, we'll change it, we'll change it, whatever. So anyway, I mean, I told him this to his face, you know, and offered my help to argue against all these flawed claims. There's a manual of how to respond to all these. So here's the interesting things. When monetary policy, the Fed board is always unanimous. Like, you know, when Kevin Walsh objected to QEs, he basically had to leave. Honig would object from the regional Reserve Bank on monetary. On regulation, they don't have to be consensus. So he needs four out of seven. And, you know, some of the support was tentative. Some of the statements that the governors made were full of flawed claims. And I didn't get a chance to meet all of them, but I would welcome that. So I just think there's a great confusion and a lot of politics and sort of ways of thinking and banking that are very entrenched. And so I don't know. I think, you know, what this proposal ultimately is doing is not changing the top head numbers, but tweaking risk weights a little bit. And by increasing the risk weight a little bit, that's a little bit more equity you have to have against a particular asset out of millions. Never mind that they don't take care of correlations and interest rate risk and other things, but just on the credit risk part. And so the banks are weaponizing this extremely disingenuously to make threats that you and you and you and you won't make, make a loan, which of course, once they get the cheap funding, they'll do what they'll do. They'll maximize our E, whatever. So the politics of it is really ugly. When I was in DC a couple of weeks ago, it was oozing from everywhere. 
the bombardment of lobbying was really shocking. It was never in the popular, you know, billboards and 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 right. ads on your podcast. <laughs> I mean, you know, I, I heard the ads on your podcast. Stop Basel Endgame. They have explainers on that website that are wrong. You know, students coming into my course just out of the corporate finance course is like, you're saying that equity is expensive because it's risky. What's wrong with all these companies that have plenty of equity and they don't choose to borrow even though there's no regulation? What are you talking about? This is absolute bread and butter finance. Leverage and risk, risk and return, required return is completely bread and butter. And so that's when you're even on the right side of the balance sheet and not on the cash reserve thing. It's crazy stuff. So we could say, okay, banks could be safer in a world in which yep. they're much more equity financed. Mm -hmm. What about coming from the perspective of creditors to the bank? So there's certain capital that exists in the world that seeks out bank bonds, insurance companies, uh, pensions, things like that may have a lot yeah. of demand for bank credit assets. Where does that money go in a, I, in a different world? So are you talking now about the people who are customers who are borrowing from the no, bank? No, I'm talking to lenders the people, to the, the bank. Lenders the to the, oh, okay. Great, great yeah. subject. Okay. So here's the thing. Here's what's amazing about banks. And here's the real abnormality of the bank. The deposits of which, by the way, JP Morgan Chase now has two and a half trillion dollars. Yeah. Okay. That is money that is a very unusual debt yes. because it has no collateral. This is important to understand. No collateral, but has insurance, which mm -hmm. effectively is now almost unbounded. So what happens is that the depositors are almost all the time completely passive. I mean, if they'll panic yeah. one day, but they are always just make, telling them not to panic and just go about their sure. business. So they sit there. Now, once you have this funding, it's a good time, it's a good life, because you can use the assets as collateral for the other lenders. And the other lenders come in and they have mm. collateral to their name, short-term lending, so they feel they can almost like depositors take the money out, withdraw it, and they have safe harbor laws that in a bankruptcy, they can actually walk away with a collateral. So if they, including the federal home loan banks, including even the Fed, they are safe. So in the ratcheting of leverage and in the sort of rat race to maturity, so there's another related paper saying that there's a, a race to shorten maturity. And then, of course, there's collateral races. What you have is the ability to keep shortening maturity and to keep giving collateral as a way to favor new lenders over sure. old lenders. And the most passive lenders to take advantage of are the depositors and those who back them. Sure. So that's what actually happens in the economics of it. Your ability to ratchet up your, your borrowing and the ability of your lenders to both chase their own returns. And mm -hmm. we can talk about, you know, returns offered on cocos and all of that, which in the end, wink, wink, nod, nod, are not actually absorbing losses. And we didn't mention Credit Suisse in last year's events in the spring, which happened a week or nine days after uh, Silicon Valley Bank. And that was a spectacular event in the world of banking, of, of big systemic institutions that requires a lot of a whole discussion we may not have time for. But all the talk in the same, you know, couple of years that I went to Davos about how we're going to have bail-ins instead of bail-outs and all these TLACs yeah. and long-term debt proposal, which completely triggered me over the Martin Luther King weekend when I was preparing these comment letters, once again, extraordinarily exacerbated that I even have to do this totally Groundhog Day. They don't. They don't. As Tom Honing likes to say, why are we solving a problem of too much debt with more debt? If you have equity instead of the long-term debt, instead of these total loss-absorbing capacity, you would not get to that level. If Silicon Valley Bank had 20% equity, it would absorb those losses from interest rate decreases. If Credit Suisse, you know, more meaningful, I'm saying better measured equity, we wouldn't be here. I was just remembering the first time I ever wrote about contingent capital. It was on FT Alphaville. And even that I, you're right, there was this discussion about like whether or not it would actually get used in an emergency. But maybe just to help us understand the argument, you know, it's so hard even for me and I've been covering financials for a long time to imagine a banking business model where they're not borrowing and lending and highly leveraged. So I want to ask, like, is Having there 20 percent equity and seven, 70 or 80 percent debt is it allows you to do all the borrowing and lending you you need to do is it allows you to take all the deposits, allow you to make all the loans you make. I take the point. But what I want to ask is, like, if you think about 
your like ideal banking mm-hmm. system. What does it look like? It, does it exist somewhere in the world already, mm, okay. or has it existed in the past? Has it existed in the past? Definitely. Before safety nets, for, first of all, when banks were partnerships, not even limited liability corporations, they had 50% equity and unlimited liability for the Jamie Diamonds of the of the, of the world. In other words, they were their own money and they had the, to be the ones insuring depositors back in the 19th century. You know, the, the, the depositors won't trust them otherwise. They, somebody had to back it up. We go into a world in which we introduce, after runs and panics and all of that, we introduced deposit insurance, we introduced the central banks before that. So so equity, for example, you know, when they started FDIC, banks in Kansas, for example, they didn't want FDIC insurance and they had 20% equity. So in the history of banking, you know, in the start of the 20th century, banks had 20, 30% equity. So it's not unheard of. The equity markets are more developed. If they have a business model, there are investors who will give to them at the appropriate prices. They just don't like those prices because they, what they're telling equity investors is to take on risks that's right now on other people, mm-hmm. including governments and taxpayers. So the point is, you know, my banking system would look a lot safer and all the deleveraging that would happen would happen much slower. You'd have a lot more time to intervene as you see losses mount up. If you're looking, somebody should look. If it's not going to be the investors, it's going to have to be the regulators. And that's all there is to it. It's not rocket science. So, you know, and on, on, on contingent capital, there has never been an argument. Why at the point of the you force them to issue those because they also don't like those because maybe the long term, you know, unsecured investors might ask a question or two about the off chance that they would lose. They, you know, in an interview uh, in 2013, Stumpf, the CEO of Wells Fargo, said, we have a lot of uh, retail deposits and therefore we don't have a lot of debt. And I had a deposit with him, so he even forgot, like, you can't make up the nonsense, (laughs) they say. So bottom line is, you know, get the equity, retain the earnings and come back, you know, later. All right, Adnot Admadi, uh, it was so great to, to finally speak to you on this podcast and the new edition of the book, The Banker's New Clothes, is out now. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. That was great. It was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Joe, I'm glad we did that conversation because obviously there is still a lot more to say about banks, not just about how we bail them out, but maybe getting to that place, as Anant mentioned, where they don't need to be bailed out on a regular basis. I thought that was really interesting. I mean, there are a few things that stuck out to me. One is just sort of this idea of examining banks as if they're regular businesses, starting from the premise that, okay, this is a business. And we have all these successful businesses in the world that do not, especially, you know, in Silicon Valley, that do not have particularly much credit financing and yet they work. And so the question is like starting from that standpoint, why are banks so much different and how does that contribute to the risks? I also thought it was interesting her point that actually shadow banks or things that we call shadow banks, lenders that aren't necessarily part of the regulated bank system, in fact, do hold more equity. It's very intriguing to me. And so the idea that not only do they naturally hold more equity, but also presumably they wouldn't be as systemically important because of the lack of depositors. That's an interesting observation about how banks or financial institutions outside the regulated system work. Well, and they seem to be doing reasonably well (laughs) right now, right? I haven't looked at like a publicly traded BDC share price lately. So, you know, don't at me if this is completely untrue. But we talk about the golden age of private credit all the time and how quickly that industry is expanding. And in many ways, they're doing the same thing that banks are just without, I guess, the, the regulatory requirements attached to that, but also the funding benefits. This idea of... The obsession with return on equity, it almost sounds like, you know, a conspiracy between bank executives and the shareholders, right? Which is obviously the shareholders don't want to get diluted by having more equity and the executives want their salary to be tied to how much can they, how much profits can they make on the equity, et cetera, but not necessarily being in the best interest of society and depositors who just want their money back yeah exactly (laughs) no a lot of interesting ideas there i'm glad we had her on all right uh shall we leave it there let's leave it there this has been another episode of the odd lots podcast i'm tracy alloway you can follow me at tracy alloway 
And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me at The Stalwart. Follow our guest, Anat Admadi at Anat Admadi, And check out the new edition of her book, The Banker's New Clothes. Follow our producers, Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Ehrman, Dashiell Bennett at Dashbot, and Kale Brooks at Kale Brooks. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots. We have transcripts, a blog, and a newsletter. And check out the Discord, discord.gg slash oddlots. And if you enjoy oddlots, if you like it when we do deep dives into the business of being a bank, then please leave us a positive review on your favorite podcast platform. And remember, if you are a Bloomberg subscriber, you can listen to all of our episodes absolutely ad-free. All you need to do is connect your Bloomberg account to Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. 